Hi, welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy, where today we will look at part two of the Federalist era covering the presidencies of George Washington and John Adams. In previous lessons, we learned how the United States won their independence from Britain with the Treaty of Paris. But today we'll see how European nations, including the British, were not ready to give up on North America. Last time we looked at the newly created executive branch with our new president, George Washington, sworn in in 1789 in New York City. And we saw how two members of his cabinet, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, had very different visions for how the United States should be run. Hamilton wanted to encourage a strong federal financial policy creating the National Bank and enacting tariffs or taxes on imports, both of which Jefferson and his followers were worried favored manufacturers and traders over southern farmers. Finally, we learned how President Washington put down a rebellion that had arisen over these economic policies, using the military to enforce the law in what was known as the Whiskey Rebellion, demonstrating to the country that this was a more powerful federal government than it had been under the Articles of Confederation. Again, we need to learn how Washington and Adams dealt with the early challenges faced by our republic. And today we'll focus more on the foreign policy and the rise of political factions. And just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint with a wide variety of activities are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just click the link in the notes below this video or search for Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teachers Pay Teachers. Here are some key terms that we will be using during this lesson. Impressment, partisan, alien, and sedition. So hit pause if you want to write down these definitions. So let's start with Western expansion. By 1790, settlers had been pouring into the area of land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. Within a few years, Kentucky and Tennessee would become states. Meanwhile, tens of thousands more poured into what was known as the Northwest Territory. And this led to some early challenges for America. After Washington had used force to shut down the Whiskey Rebellion, he set his sights on European and Native American problems in the Northwest Territory. The British and Spanish had been encouraging the Native Americans to attack American settlers. Washington signed treaties with the Native Americans, promising them land in the Northwest Territory when settlers ignored these treaties and moved into this region anyway. The two groups attacked each other. This territory was surrounded by the British to the north and the Spanish to the south. The natives of the Northwest Territory rallied behind a chief of the Miami people named Little Turtle, who formed a confederacy with the Shawnee, Delaware, and other native bands. They were determined to protect their lands from further white settlements, and they would ambush General Arthur St. Clair's army, who was sent out by Washington after a devastating loss in what is known as St. Clair's Defeat, in which 600 U.S. soldiers were killed in 1791. The Americans again turned to France, hoping their alliance might help them gain control of the West. However, in response, the British built a fort in present-day Ohio and encouraged more Native American attacks. Again, the British did not want to give up this territory, and this would not be settled until the War of 1812. In 1794, Washington turned to General Anthony Wayne, who had earned the nickname Mad Anthony in the Revolutionary War for his military exploits and a fiery personality. During the Battle of Fallen Timbers, Wayne destroyed the Native Americans near present-day Toledo, Ohio. The Native Americans were forced to sign the Treaty of Greenville, surrendering most of present-day Ohio. These were the first in many treaties the Native Americans would be forced to sign throughout the 1800s, giving up land to American settlers. Meanwhile, events in Europe were changing drastically. In 1789, the French Revolution broke out. At first, most Americans applauded the French in following their lead of declaring revolution. However, as the revolution became more bloody, Americans became divided in their support for the French. 
after King Louis the 16th and Queen Marie Antoinette literally lost their heads. Other monarchical European nations panic. In 1793, England and France were back at war with each other, and the American public and politicians became divided over who to support. The French, who had backed us in the revolution, or the British, our recent adversary. Washington hoped to stay neutral. The French Revolution became an issue which would help divide these new burgeoning political parties. Factions had broken out behind those who supported Hamilton, known as the Federalists, and Jefferson's supporters called the Democratic Republicans, who mostly called themselves Republicans, although this party had nothing to do with either today's Democrats or Republicans. The Federalists, for the most part, favored England in this conflict, and Republicans favored the French. Both the French and the British wanted the Americans to help them fight the war. The French tried to recruit Americans while the British tried to block trade with the French. President Washington issued a proclamation of neutrality, but this proclamation didn't hold much weight. The British began capturing American ships and forcing sailors to join the British Navy in a practice called impressment. This greatly angered many Americans. Washington sent the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay, to negotiate a treaty with the British. Known as Jay's Treaty, it called for, quote, amity or friendship, commerce and navigation, in other words, freedom of the seas. Washington's agreement with the British was very unpopular with some, especially Jefferson's Republicans. Worried after the Jay Treaty that the U.S. and Britain might take over their North American holdings, the Spanish signed Pinckney's Treaty. This allowed the U.S. to use the Mississippi River and ship from New Orleans. This was a treaty applauded by Western farmers. Despite the unpopularity of Jay's treaty, Washington kept the United States out of war. After eight years as president, Washington stepped down as our first executive. In his farewell address, he warned Americans to, quote, steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. This policy of neutrality would last in America for a long time, mostly up until the World Wars in the 1900s. By stepping down after two terms as president, Washington established a precedent that no future president would break until 1941 when Franklin Roosevelt began his third term. Signed in 1947 following Roosevelt, the 22nd Amendment was passed making it law that presidents could only serve two terms. But it speaks to the reputation of Washington that no future president except one would want to break that precedent established by the father of America. Of course, his retirement demonstrated one more important concept. It demonstrated what we call the peaceful transfer of power that is the American system. Washington returned to his beloved Mount Vernon where he died three years later in 1799. He had, at times reluctantly, served his country since 1775. His sacrifices in holding together this fledgling union truly earned him the title of father of the country. In his will, he decreed that his 300 slaves would be freed upon the death of his wife. So who would lead next? With this remarkable transfer of power, the question faced the nation over who would take over as president. This was another test of the American democratic system in a time where violence and family lineage usually decided the next executive. By now, political parties were in full effect. Political parties were often called factions in those days, and two groups had evolved made up of those who supported Alexander Hamilton's economic policies, again, the Federalist, and those who supported Jefferson and a less powerful national government, and those were the Democratic Republicans. While there is nothing about political parties in the Constitution, some felt that it was a natural progression for those who held different positions on the issues. Most of the public didn't like parties, and even George Washington had warned about the danger of political factions or parties, exclaiming the need to watch out for the, quote, baneful effects of the spirit of party. Here's a look at where the two parties differed. While Federalists thought the national government was supreme, Republicans thought it was the state governments who should be more powerful. 
Federalists favored manufacturing while Republicans farming. Federalists thought power should be held by the wealthy, the educated, the business owners, and Republicans thought that all male landowners should have power. Federalists liked tariffs, Republicans hated them. And finally, Federalists wanted a loose in interpretation of the Constitution with its implied powers. And Republicans wanted a strict interpretation with the government only having those powers expressed in the Constitution. By the way, many of these issues are exactly the same ones that modern Democrats and Republicans argue about today. If you want an easy way to remember, think Federalists believing that manufacturing and trade were the basis of national wealth and power, while Republicans believed in an agrarianism, or that farmers who are landowners are independent with ideal social values and make up the best of what America should be. All of this would take us to the election of 1796. The election of 1796 was the first contested presidential contest. The Federalists nominated Vice President John Adams, while the Democratic Republicans rallied around Thomas Jefferson. Anger over Jay's treaty by those who favored France almost gave the election to Jefferson, but Adams won by 71 to 68 electoral votes. The way the Electoral College worked in those days, Jefferson would become the Vice President. Adams would inherit what would become called the Quasi-War with France. Angered by the Jay Treaty, the French started intercepting American ships, and while some Federalists called for war with France, Adams sent John Marshall, Charles Pinckney, and Elbridge Geary to negotiate peace in 1797. There they were to meet with French Foreign Minister Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. However, scandal would break out around this mission when three agents saying they represented Talleyrand told the Americans that they would need a bribe of $250,000 and a $12 million loan. Adams told Congress about the event, referring to the agents as X, Y, and Z, and this event became known as the XYZ Affair. Americans became outraged. This cartoon from the time depicted the event. The United States is represented by the women being plundered by the French, and the group of men to the right represent the European nations watching. Many American citizens began demanding war with France. In response to the XYZ affair, Congress suspended trade with France and told US ships to capture French vessels. In essence, the two countries were at war. This quasi-war with the French impacted politics as well. Adams was able to avoid war and sign a treaty with France, but the conflict had become extremely political. Federalists, who again often sided with the British and suffered the political consequences of Jay's treaty, now saw a chance to pounce on the Republicans. Here we see a fight that broke out on the floor of Congress in which Federalist Roger Griswold attacked Democratic Republican Matthew Lyon. At the height of anger with the French, the Federalist Congress pushed through a set of laws known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. Aliens are people living in the U.S. who are not citizens, and sedition is when you print or say bad things about the government. The Alien Acts were aimed at French and Irish immigrants, who were often anti-British and often voted Republican. The Sedition Act was meant to avoid rebellions, but allowed anti-Federalist newspaper writers to be arrested for printing bad things about them, and some were. Sadly, in times of war or crisis, immigrants and the free press have sometimes been targets. Up next, we're going to look at how backlash to the Alien Sedition Acts, as well as the Federalists, gave rise to the age of Jefferson. And that's where we'll pick up next time. But before we do, let's review. What did the British and Spanish encourage the Native Americans to do to American settlers? Attack them. When the Americans turned to France for help with the British and Spanish, what did the British do? They built a fort in Ohio and they encouraged more Native American attacks. What battle did General Anthony Wayne defeat the Native Americans in? The Battle of Fallen Timbers. What event broke out in Europe in 1789 which would have a major impact on American and European politics? The French Revolution. Which side did the Federalists favor between the British and the French? the British. Which side did Washington favor in the war between the British and the French? Neither. He wanted to stay neutral. 
What controversial treaty stopped the British from capturing our ships and forcing our sailors to join their navy? The Jay Treaty. What did Washington warn about in his farewell address? Foreign alliances and political parties. What were the two major parties that developed behind Jefferson and Hamilton? The Federalist and the Democratic Republicans. Which party favored manufacturing? The Federalists. Which party favored agriculture? That's easy. The Democratic Republicans. Which party wanted a more powerful national government? The Federalists. What was it called when the United States was essentially at war with France? The Quasi-War. What was the scandalous event called when the French ministers tried to get the U.S. to bribe them? The XYZ Affair. What laws were passed by the Federalists in response to the XYZ Affair? The Alien and Sedition Acts. And that's it. I want to thank you guys for watching. Be sure to subscribe because up next we're going to look at the Jefferson era. And just a reminder, teachers at this PowerPoint with worksheets, smart board activities, quizzes, cahoots, guided notes, flip class video, and additional resources are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just click the link in the notes below this video or search for Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teachers Pay Teachers. Keep up that good work, guys, and you're going to ace that exam.